Thank you, David, for that song. Uh, it really does <laughs> summarize uh, the message for this morning. So let's close in prayer and go to snack time. <laughs> now, please open with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5, where we're going to continue uh, in, I think, what is probably one of the most profound and well-loved messages that mankind has ever heard. Imagine what it might have been like to have been on that mountain years ago and listened to the voice of the Son of God talk about these, uh, these attitudes that David just sang about. What would you think? Um, actually, we don't even need to speculate about that. Uh, the scripture tells us at the end of that message that says, The multitudes were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority, not as their scribes. Um, I think if we were there, it would have been both amazing and convicting as we hear the Lord move from the externals of religion and talk about issues of the heart, attitudes of the heart that David was just singing of. Jesus wants to see the reality of these attitudes um, in our lives. Why is that? Well, I believe, uh, first of all, he was trying to correct uh, some of the teaching of that time that really focused more on rituals and externals rather than these inner attitudes that Christ wanted to see <clears throat> lived out in our lives. He said, I say to you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So I don't think the message was um, a presentation on the way of salvation as, as much as it was describing what life looks like to someone who's in a right relationship with God. And then secondly, I think as Nate, Nate mentioned last week, Jesus really wants to see his character lived out in our lives. I think one of God's great purposes in life is to populate the world with believers who remind him of his son, remind the father of his son, the Lord Jesus. And so as subjects in his kingdom, he wants us to accurately represent him uh, to a, <clears throat> an unbelieving and often skeptical world around us. And really, as we've seen the character of kingdom life, I think it's, it could easily be summed up. It's the life of Jesus Christ. It's the life of Christ lived out in his people. It's really an ideal life. Um, the Lord Jesus paints a very high picture of that life. And as we look at it, if you're like me, you say, Lord, I just, <laughs> I can't do this. The, the standard is just too high. But I appreciate what someone said about ideals. Ideals are like the stars. We will never reach them, but by them we guide our course. We'll never reach them, but by them we guide our course. The Christian life isn't just difficult. It's, it's impossible. <laughs> it's impossible to live without the life of Jesus Christ indwelling us, without the Spirit of God himself living in us and empowering us uh, to live this kind of life. Uh, it can only be lived in utter dependence on His Spirit living in us. So in this passage this morning in Matthew 5, starting in verse 13, the Lord Jesus is going to move from describing the character of that life to what it means to, to live it out as salt and light in the world today. And He's going to use two very simple metaphors. Uh, to talk about that, salt and light. So he begins in Matthew 5.13 saying, you, you are the salt of the earth. Interesting, interesting of all the substances he could have chosen, he didn't say, uh, you're the sugar of the earth. Uh, I mean, if you were a diabetic or, or a dentist, you might, <clears throat> you might wonder about that. <laughs> Maybe he didn't want us to sugarcoat his message. Interesting, he also didn't say you should be the salt of the earth. He said you are. You are the salt of the earth. So why salt? Well, it's interesting. I think there's a number of good reasons why he picked that substance. Uh, first of all, salt creates thirst. Uh, 
Uh, whenever we're sitting in front of the TV watching a, a football game and you're munching on salted peanuts or chips or popcorn, it's not long before you're thirsty. You want something to drink. Uh, farmers know you can lead a, a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But you can put salt in his oats and he will drink. So salt creates thirst, and, and I guess the question for us is, does my life create a thirst for Jesus Christ in the lives of others? I remember years ago, the first Bible study I went to at, when I was a freshman at, at UC Davis <clears throat> back in the last millennium, uh, <laughs> a friend of mine invited me to, to that study, and at first I was skeptical. I wasn't sure if I wanted to go, but I said, okay, I'll, I'll try anything once. And as I went and I, I watched these people, they just had something I wish I had. I'd, I was a religious person. I'd, I'd been baptized as an infant, grew up as an altar boy, was confirmed. But they had something I didn't have. And, it, and just being with them created a thirst to know why, why are they different? What is it about these people that makes them tick? And I, as, I, as the night wore on, I found it found out they had a, a personal relationship with, with Jesus Christ. So hopefully our lives are making others thirsty for him. Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Jesus Christ is the only one who can satisfy the deepest longings and thirsts of our heart. And so we want to point people to him who, who really is the fountain of living waters. Another reason I think the Lord mentions salt, <clears throat> salt adds taste. Uh, adds taste to food. Uh, without salt, food can be pretty flat, <clears throat> tasteless, uh, insipid, uh, bland. Uh, hopefully as Christians, our, our lives add taste to the lives of others especially in our conversation. In Colossians 4, 6, it says, Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how to, to respond to each person. So hopefully our conversation isn't putting people to sleep. <laughs> hopefully it's not dull and boring <laughs> that we're uh, adding flavor to their life. Our, our speech is to be gracious, but it's also to be seasoned with salt, which means I think we're to tell it like it is. <laughs> We're to speak the truth, but to speak it in love. Hopefully our lives invite others to, to the, what that, that truth in Psalm 34, 6 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. We want others to taste of him and his goodness. Salt is a preservative. Um, years ago when, when I was in the Philippines, we'd sometimes go to the wet market <clears throat> where they were selling fresh meat. And 30 years ago, there wasn't a whole lot of refrigeration. So what, what the vendor would do is when you bought some meat, he'd sprinkle it with salt so you'd make it home without that meat spoiling. Uh, and when it does spoil, you know it. <clears throat> uh, you can smell it. <laughs> um, so the Lord wants us to be preservatives against spoilage in a world that is really more and more rotten <laughs> every day. Uh, he wants our lives to be a hindrance to that spoilage. I, I think of what Nate said last week when people, when he was working as a waiter and people found out, his coworkers found out he was a believer, uh, their language changed. Now, I, had, I had the same experience in the Navy. Uh, you, where you, that expression, swearing like a sailor, <laughs> you hear it every day. But when the guys found out that you were a Christian, they'd tone it down. And sometimes they'd even apologize because they knew you were a believer in Christ. And really on a larger scale, the presence of Christians in the world today is it's a hindrance to evil. Uh, we see that in 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 and 7, where it says, you know <clears throat> what restrains him, and that's referring to the Antichrist, the lawless one. What restrains him now so that in his time he may, re may be revealed? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. So who is this one who restrains? Uh, Bible scholars have different ideas on that. Some, some say it's human government <clears throat> restraining evil. I'm not so sure about that. 
Uh, you look at some of the corruption in, the, in governments around the world. Um, I believe that restrainer is, is the presence of the Holy Spirit indwelling the church today. And we know a time is coming when the rapture occurs and the Holy Spirit will be, in a sense, removed from the church. He's omniscient, he'll always be there, but his presence in the life of believers will be gone. And at that point, I think all hell's going to break loose on planet Earth. It's going to be a horrible, horrible time. So hopefully in the meantime, we as believers are acting as a preservative against the spread of evil in a world that's rotting in sin. Salt can be a picture of judgment. This was a new one in my study. I appreciate a, appreciate a fellow named R.H. Sykes who uh, he pointed this out. Can you think of a person in whose life salt was used as an instrument of judgment? Somebody in the Old Testament? Actually, it was a lady. Yeah, Lot's wife. What happened to Lot's wife? Yeah. Judgment was coming on Sodom and Gomorrah. God sent some angelic messengers uh, to, to tell them to get out of town. Uh, they, they, they said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you. Do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. But then what happened with Lot's wife? But Lot's wife, from behind him, looked back. She became a pillar of salt because of her disobedience. Now, I know there's some people who question this story, but I think we have to remember the Lord Jesus himself referred to it <laughs> in Luke 17. Speaking of coming judgment, he said, Remember Lot's wife. One verse. <laughs> so that if, if Jesus believed in Lot's wife, Turning into a pillar of salt, that's good enough for me. <laughs> I believe it too. <laughs> I doubt if any of us will ever become a pillar of salt, but I think this story is a reminder to us about the importance of self-judgment. Better that we examine and judge ourselves rather than the Lord himself. And we see that concept in 1 Corinthians 11. 1. It says, if we judge ourselves rightly, we will not be judged. So if we're going to be salt in this world, I think we want to be careful to judge ourselves before the world does or before God himself does. So the importance of self-examination in our life if we want to be salt. Otherwise, we run the risk of being labeled hypocrites. <laughs> These, this church is just filled with hypocrites. Well, that, that could be, especially if I'm not judging sin in my life. Another thing about salt uh, salt was considered a valuable commodity, especially back in the ancient world. It was often used as currency. There's a book called The, Current, the Encyclopedia of Currency. It said the, wor the word salary, and, and I, this was a new thing that I just found out, comes from the Latin word salarium, which means salt money. So next time you get paid, <laughs> that salary thousands of years ago was paid in a brick of salt. It's much better to get a paycheck nowadays. Uh, uh, Romans paid soldiers, officers, and civil administrators uh, with an allowance of salt. And that word salarium became a term for military pay in the Roman world. Uh, it, gives, it gives added uh, meaning to, to that phrase. Maybe we've heard, that guy's worth his salt. So there was value attached to salt. It was a currency back then, almost in every quarter of the world back in the ancient uh, world. Interesting, salt was even part of the Old Testament offerings. And I didn't realize this. Le Leviticus 2, verse 13, Every grain offering of yours, moreover, you shall season with salt, so that the salt of the covenant of your, your God shall not be lacking from your grain offering. With all, with all your offerings, you shall offer salt. So salt was considered valuable, not only to people, but to God as well. It was an important part of that offering. It symbolized something of value to God. And I think even today, as we seek to offer ourselves as a, a living sacrifice to him, he looks at that, and we as the salt of the earth, he sees that as something valuable. 
He sees that as something precious if we're wanting to offer ourselves to him in his service. And when we do that, we want to be profitable servants for him. Another thing about salt, salt was associated with an everlasting covenant with the Lord. Numbers 18, verse 19, all the offerings of the holy gifts which the sons of Israel offered to the Lord, I've given to you and your sons and your daughters with you as a perpetual allotment. It's an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord to you and your descendants with you. So salt was a symbol of a covenant with God. Uh, Ryrie says it signified permanence and incorruptibility. Uh, Sykes says in, in Bible lands, when a covenant was made between two parties, it was signed by both parties tasting some salt. Uh, and I didn't realize that. So it was a sign of incorruptibility and permanence. So hopefully we can remember that as the king's people, we're in a covenant relationship with him, and we should be known as people who, whose covenants, whose promises can be depended on, uh, that we're promise keepers, that we're, we're people of our word. Uh, that adds to us being salt in the world. And then lastly, one other characteristic of salt, <clears throat> it has a healing effect. Uh, here's some free medical advice. <laughs> if, you, if you have a sore throat or an infection or canker sores, one of the best remedies for that, and it's free, you don't have to have a prescription, half a teaspoon of salt in warm water, gargle with that, and it'll sting. Salt does sting on an open wound, but it, it, it brings healing and cleansing and fights infection. And hopefully as believers, our lives as salt are bringing healing uh, to those around us who are hurting uh, through the power of the gospel lived out in our lives. So these are some interesting characteristics of salt. I believe that's why the Lord chose those. But you know, he also gives a warning. He says, if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? How can salt lose its saltiness? It almost seems like a contradiction in terms. It's like sugar not being sweet. How can salt lose its saltiness? We know if you're a chemist, salt is a stable compound, sodium chloride. Uh, it doesn't change very much. But we have to remember back in Jesus' day, uh, salt wasn't pure. Uh, in fact, if that salt came from the Dead Sea, uh, there was a lot of other stuff <laughs> mixed in with that. Um, the normal mineral content of seawater is about 4%. The mineral content of the Dead Sea is 29%. Uh, that's why you can go and float <clears throat> with your arms and legs up in the Dead Sea because of all that salt content. But only 12 to 18% of that mineral content of, of the Dead Sea is actually sodium chloride. So it, it can easily be washed out, and all you're left with is just a, a mass of residue <laughs> that doesn't even taste salty. And it, it can't be made salty again. So what does Jesus say? What happens to it? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Um, about the only use for it is on your garden path uh, as a decoration when it talks about being thrown and thrown out and trampled underfoot by men, it's, this isn't talking about a loss of salvation, but a loss of testimony to other people. Bill McDonald said, The disciple has one great function in life, to be the salt of the earth, by living out the terms of discipleship listed in the Beatitudes and throughout the rest of the sermon. If he fails to exhibit this spiritual re reality, men will tread his testimony under feet, the world only has contempt for an undedicated believer. I think another way salt can lose its flavor is if it stays in the salt shaker. Um, years ago, I, I appreciated a book by Rebecca Manley Pippert, <clears throat> Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World. Uh, and the whole thesis of that book was, so often we spend most of our life in the salt shaker. <laughs> And we're not sprinkling the good news of Christ to those around us. She had a good insight when it came to evangelism. Uh, she said that Christians and non-Christians have something in common about evangelism. Uh, 
we're both uptight about it. <laughs> we're both nervous about it. <laughs> and you know we really shouldn't be? We have the greatest message in the world. We're talking about the best friend, the best master that anyone could ever know. Why should we be ashamed? You know, the, uh, these other special interest groups, they're not ashamed. LGBT, <laughs> they're not ashamed. Why am I ashamed of the gospel? Uh, it's the greatest message anyone could hear. And the book gives some very practical helps as to how to overcome our anxiety about evangelism and really to have evangelism as a natural part of our everyday life with our co-workers and neighbors. So the idea here is we need to get out of the salt shaker and be poured out into the world. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. Salt seems like such a common substance, doesn't it? Something very simple. I appreciated James Boyce's comment on this. He said, salt is one of the most common things in life. It's found everywhere. Hence, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. He was saying, I like to use simple things, common things. It's from the common things, from the weak, the foolish, the despised, the things that are not, that God brings the greatest glory to his name. God uses small, common things. God wants to use you and I that his work might go forth in the world today. So we're the salt of the earth. And then the Lord Jesus used a second metaphor that, uh, again, David was singing about. You're the light of the world. How many of you have ever been in total darkness? Uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, thousands of people traveled for thousands of miles to, to experience totality, uh, to be in the shadow of uh, the eclipse, something that only happens about every hundred years. Uh, so you can understand the excitement about that. And it, it must have been amazing to see in the middle of the day, sunset, 360 degrees all around you uh, in that total eclipse. But there was still enough light to see, at least from what I saw on the internet. You could still see things around you. But have you ever been in a situation where you were in total darkness? Um, I, I may have mentioned this before. When I was in the Navy, the clinic that we were in in, in the Philippines used to be a bomb shelter <clears throat> with uh, sliding steel doors and no windows. <laughs> and whenever we had a, a brownout or a blackout, it was dark. And you were even afraid to stand up and walk because you were afraid you're going to bump into something or someone. Uh, and what a picture that was of my life uh, before I came to know the Lord. I was living in spiritual darkness, living away from the light, and things only got worse. Uh, if, as it says in Ephesians 5, 8, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Interesting, that verse doesn't say, for you were formerly in darkness. It says, you were darkness. My life was characterized by darkness. I was under the powers of darkness. I was headed for eternal darkness. Darkness was my life. And I'm very thankful for, for Christians uh, back at Davis who patiently, lovingly shared the gospel with me with their lives and with the words that they said. My roommate was a Christian at the time. He, I'd come home from parties, staggering in the door. He'd put me to bed <laughs> and continue to love me. Um, that was the light that I sensed from believers around me, that examples of what Jesus said when he said, you're the light of the world. And we know that Jesus himself made that claim. He said, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And what a, what a privilege it is when we come to know Christ, he takes us out of the dark <laughs> and we begin to walk with him in the light. And of course, he's the very essence of light. In him was life and, and the life was the light of men. We see the, the connect, this intimate connection between light and life. Without light, there's no life. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. Does that mean every man is saved? Uh, no, it depends on how you respond to the light. Uh, later in John chapter 3, verse 19, it says, This is the judgment that the light has come into the world, 
and men loved darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Remember living in the Philippines, there were times we, I'd walk into a darkened room and turn on the light <clears throat> and I'd hear all kinds of critters <laughs> scatter, whether cockroaches or rats. Uh, they didn't like the light. And what a, boy, what a picture that was of my life. As I, as I was running, from, there was a time I was running from Christians uh, before I came to know the Lord. Why? Because they exposed the darkness. They exposed the sin in my own life. But praise the Lord for the last part of that verse. He who practices the truth comes to the light. If, if I'm truthful with God about who I am and my condition and I confess that to him and come to Christ, who's the light of the world, he takes me out of that darkness, and by his grace allows me to walk with him in his light. So Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, but then he tells us, you're the light of the world. So how do we reconcile those two statements? Donald, Donald Gray Barnhouse commented on that. He says, when Christ was in the world, he was a bit like the sun, which is here in the day, but gone at night. But when the sun goes down, the moon comes up, and the moon is a picture of the church, of Christians. It shines not by its own light. It shines only because it reflects the light of the sun. At times, the church is a full moon in the midst, perhaps, of revival. But at other times, the church is a new moon, and you can barely see it. Whether it's a full moon or a new moon or somewhere in between, it glows because of the sun. And in the same way, our lives, we want to reflect the light of Christ, who is the source of light in our lives. And so the question we have is, am I reflecting the light of Christ in my life to those around me? Jesus uses another example. He says, a city, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. You know, when you're driving at night and you're approaching a, a city, you can tell that city is there from miles away because of the glow in the sky and the lights as you approach that city, especially if it's elevated. And so I think this metaphor is a, is a symbol of our corporate fellowship uh, together as lights of the world. Hopefully it's something that can be seen. How visible is our fellowship to other people around us, to our neighborhood? How visible is the love and joy and fellowship we enjoy together? Jesus said, by this, all men will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And I thank God since first walking in the door at Hillview Bible Chapel back in 1981 for the love and joy I've sensed in this fellowship. Uh, so hill, Hillview is not just viewing a hill. I think we are a city on a hill that shines, lighting up the night for his glory. And then the Lord said in verse 15, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So I think this verse is talking about our individual witness. A city on the hill is our corporate witness, this is talking about our individual witness as believers. Each of us is to be a lamp that gives light to everyone in the house. That's why it's put on a lampstand. Uh, that's why we shouldn't put a basket on it. Um, it doesn't make sense. But how can that happen? How can that happen in our lives that we end up putting a basket over our lamp? Uh, there's a brother named Danny Hall. Uh, who said there's at least a couple ways that we can hide our light under a basket. Uh, the first is, he said, separating our spiritual lives from the rest of our lives. Our lives get fragmented, compartmentalized into work or school or family or recreation. And so when I go to work, uh, that's work time. And in a sense, that's the way it should be. I, sh I should be giving eight hours of work for eight hours of pay to my boss. Uh, I shouldn't be taking away from work time to be preaching the gospel. But at work, there's, there's break times, there's lunch time, and hopefully just my work ethic 
and the way I'm portraying Christ is being seen by others. Um, maybe when we're with my family, I, well, I consider that's family time. Or if I'm uh, doing sports or working out, well, that's exercise time. Uh, and, and when I'm at church, that's church time. And what he's saying is we, we can end up compartmentalizing our life in, in such a way that the gospel gets hidden from those around us. He said, instead, our walk with Christ should permeate every area and manifest itself in everything we do and say in life. The second way Hall says we can hide our lamp under a basket is by isolating our community of faith from the rest of the world. He says it's so easy to get focused on the internal workings of our church and isolate ourselves. Particularly in the States, we have developed a whole Christian subculture that we can hide in. Studies have shown that for the average American who comes to Christ, within three years, he or she will no longer have any significant relationships or friendships with a non-Christian person. We get absorbed into our Christian subculture. And now there's good things about that. We need that nurturing. We need that fellowship. We need that time together. But what happens over time is that we begin more and more, we become more and more ingrown, and most of us truly have a hard time being able to speak of any significant relationship we have with people outside the community of faith, and our lights get hidden. And all for good motives, all for good reasons, but we can neglect being light to those around us. And so the Lord tells us, he says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You know, he, he finishes up this section with, it's not just a suggestion, <laughs> it's, it's a command. Let your light shine before men. I guess to use a modern illustration, uh, how many watts is my light? Is it 25 25 watts? <laughs> uh, is it 50 watts? That's a little better. Or maybe 100 watts. So we got this new lighting system. We've got to make use of it here. <laughs> How often does my light shine? You know, during Christmas time, we, we put up uh, lights on our tree, and they've got this little box where you can, you can change the, the cycle of it, and it, it'll flash on and off, on and off. Uh, so is my life like that Christmas light? It just kind of goes off and on. Or, or maybe it's just unplugged. <laughs> I'm, I'm unplugged from the source of power. If I'm out of fellowship with the Lord, who's the light, yeah, I'm not going to be able to shine for Him. Does it just shine on Sunday morning and maybe Wednesday night or Friday night? Or is it shining throughout the week? You know, however bright our light might be, uh, however many watts. I think of that song maybe we learned at Sunday school. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Oh, what a great reminder to us. When it talks about letting our light shine, uh, that men may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. I appreciated uh, some commentary by a guy named Keith Krell. Uh, he says, it's important to notice that the light is not equated with good works. Rather, the light illumines the good works in such a way that men notice them and glorify God. What is it that lights up our works for the glory of God? He says, I believe it's our verbal testimony to Jesus Christ. Good works by themselves are not light. They must be illuminated by words that direct attention and tribute to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our lives are not adequate witness apart from our words. To use an airplane illustration, you need two wings to fly. <laughs> and one of those wings is our, our words and the other is our life. So I think you need both those wings to fly that plane it says, our lives are not an adequate witness apart from our words. If you have, your most, you have your most spiritual day and your good works are clearly evident, your co-workers and classmates may just assume that you're a good Mormon. <laughs> but if you name the name of Christ, 
people will know whose you are and where your works stem from. So there really is a need for both, isn't there? Uh, we need to live out our faith, uh, but also speak it out and tell others why we are the way we are. Uh, as, as light shines and people see our good deeds, who's to get the glory? Obviously, it's not us. Uh, it's the Lord himself. Uh, we want to be like John the Baptist, who said, he must increase and I must decrease. So God wants us to let our light shine. He wants us to be salt of the earth and the light of the world. How, how can we do that? Well, I think first we can pray. Pray for unsaved relatives, classmates, co-workers, and neighbors. You know, it's interesting, as I was given this topic a month and a half or so ago, speaking on salt and light, I thought, wow, am I doing that in my own life? And I began to pray, Lord, uh, please open up doors for me to share. And uh, actually, that's the kind of prayer God loves to answer. <laughs> um, during the eclipse, I actually had a great conversation with my neighbor, who's a, who's a Hindu. When we got talking about the eclipse and all the science and the universe beyond, and, and it was a great opening just to talk about bigger things than our everyday lives. I think secondly, we can take to heart Peter's admonition in 1 Peter 3.15. 3, he says, sanctify Christ as Lord of your heart, Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So first of all, what, is, what does that first phrase mean? To sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. That, the word sanctify means to set apart, to consider holy, to uh, consecrate. And so I think it's, it's hard for us to be a witness for Christ if I'm not submitted to him. If I'm not walking in fellowship with him, uh, it's almost futile to try to witness for him. Uh, the most effective witness is when we're submitted to him and sanctifying him in our life and, and recognizing him for who he really is. Just like those folks did on the, on the mount so many thousand years, years ago. I appreciate something that James Stewart said about our view of Christ. He said, once any man has looked into Christ's eyes and felt the magnetism of his way of life, he is never going to be satisfied with the secular ideas and standards that may have seemed adequate before Christ came. Christ has spoiled him for anything else. The old standards have become cinders and ashes and dust. Thank God for that. So we want to sanctify Christ as Lord in our hearts and then be ready, ready to make a defense to everyone who asks us. That word defense, that's from the Greek word apologia. Uh, not that we're apologetic <laughs> about our faith, but it means to give a defense of our faith. And I think one of the best defenses of the reality of Christ in our life is our own testimony of what Christ did in our lives when we came to, to know and trust him. Uh, I think another part of that defense is to have a, an outline of the gospel memorized, to have a track to run on when we speak with others about Christ. We want to do a good job of sharing what the gospel is with others. And we here at Hillview have a gospel outline that uh, is really, really helpful in doing that. Be good to carry some tracks with us. Um, I, you know, for years I've carried this little uh, pouch of tracks. I actually got it in the Philippines. I don't know if I've told this story. Um, years ago, Shelley and I were at a mall in Manila, <clears throat> and uh, we were coming down an escalator, and there were two well-dressed men. One was in front of us, and the other was behind us. And the guy in front of us, as soon as we got to the bottom of the escalator, he just stopped cold. And we ran into it. And at the time, I was pushing a stroller, I think, with Luke in it. And I ran into this fellow. And then the guy behind me ran into me. And unbeknownst to me, when he did that, he was opening up my backpack. And he was looking for my wallet. And he actually followed it. I sort of looked around and wondered, what's this fellow doing? He, we walked into a, a pizza place and, uh, where there was a buffet of different kinds of pizza. 
And this same guy was following us, and he was right up, right over my shoulder, looking over. And again, he was, he was going through my backpack, looking for my wallet. Well, what he pulled out was this. Well, not this, but one like this. And it was a, a pouch full of tracks. Uh, so if nothing else, we can engage in pickpocket evangelism. Uh, um, so we want to carry tracks with us that we can give to folks. So we want to do it with the right spirit. Uh, that Peter says we need to do that with, with gentleness and reverence, not with a, a holier-than-thou attitude or I'm better than you are. As one, said, one person said, we, when it comes to evangelism, we're, we're just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Somebody said, as, as, as those that are going to witness for Christ, uh, we're to be witnesses and not prosecuting attorneys. Uh, we want to witness, testify to what Christ has done in our life. And so as someone said, as uh, salt and light in the world, we want to shake and shine. We want to shake and shine for him. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful message, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and just the sublime truths that we see here that so much impact our lives. Uh, Lord, help us to, to not just be hearers uh, of your word, but, but to be doers. Lord, help us to be salt and light in, uh, in, our, in our spheres of influence. Lord, there's almost 200 people in this room. Lord, help us as we go out this week to uh, be, be salt in the lives of others and to reflect the light of your glory uh, in our lives. We want to do it for your your glory and for the furtherance of your kingdom. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.